Welcome to Face to Face, and today we're going to go to California. Yeah, I know it's unusual. Sometimes we go to Europe, sometimes we go to South America. Today it's in California, San Diego, and we're going to talk about nonviolence, peace, photography, um, conscientious objectors, and uh, I'm with Francesco da Vinci, and who has been a photographer for many decades, and uh, uh, thank you so much for being on the show, Francisco. Thank you, David. So I, I have to, to share this, uh, this because I was really touched by, uh, by this cover of a book you, um, you wrote, I think, some time ago. It's yes. I Refuse to Kill, with just by the title and the photo itself. I have thousands of, of stories. Um, how did you get to that point? Well, it was uh, one of the most significant periods in American history, the 60s. Uh, many people consider it America's second revolution. So I knew it was an important decade, and I felt I had a, an important personal story to tell. And uh, the reason uh, is that it's important is not just that it's my story. It's a salute to conscientious objectors throughout American history, past and present. You know, they've made so much sacrifice. Uh, they were stigmatized. They were tortured. They were even killed. And so I wanted to pay tribute to these brave activists and do a little uh, rewrite of history. So, um, and then, so how the photography uh, click into that, uh, uh, into that situation, into that story? Yes, uh, well, going back to how I started photography, I had a pretty dysfunctional family. My parents were alcoholics, and I turned to photography as an escape, as a personal escape. And I never suspected that it would become a lifelong profession. So that's what it turned out to be. And fortunately, throughout the entire 60s, I took photographs. These were peace marches. And my path crossed with iconic figures of the time, like Bobby Kennedy, Senator Eugene McCarthy, Rosa Parks, etc. And I photographed all of them. So that's part of the book that's important to me. And it brings it to life for today's generation. You know, I want to relate to uh, this generation and inspire them to, to bring back the nonviolent activism that was the spirit of the 60s. Yeah, because it's a little bit the, the problem I have with today's society where it's complicated to find uh, what is the direction of the life of people. What, what are you going to or to? Or to? What, what does your life mean? What, where? And I think you have done a, a demonstration effect of uh, unbelievable. And by that journey, you. you end up meeting the, the most extraordinary people in the, in, in, in in the history. So um, how did you, can you go deeper on that story? Yes, uh, it was a lot of sacrifice involved. And like I'm saying uh, that when I cite the COs throughout American history, you know, that have paid such a price, you know, it's really like I was standing on their shoulders. Uh, they did so much more than I did. Um, basically my story is I came from uh, a privileged family uh, a lot of wealth. And uh, I broke away from that because I thought, you know, men, women and children were dying every day because of this needless Vietnam War. And I wanted to take a moral stand. And then I faced prison and I formed a peace group in San Diego that I called Nonviolent Action. And it grew from four people to 250 people that wow. came from all over the country meeting weekly. So it answered that need of people that they wanted to do something. And I wanted to show that people are, you know, we the people, we're not powerless unless we think we are. Alice Walker has a great quote, and she said, the, the writer, yeah. she said, you know, the way we give away our power is by thinking we don't have any. Yes, that's true. And then that's a problem with elections, that's a problem with democracy, that's a problem with everything we, we face today. So how did you, uh, how do you, we compare the, the situation of the militarization in, in the 60s and today's situation, uh, of course, with the Ukraine war and so on and so forth. There are a lot of strong parallels. First of all, we have to admit Vietnam was an invasion as Russia has invaded Ukraine. 
And, you know, look at the brave anti-war activists uh, in Russia. I mean, you know, we paid the price as an activist. You know, we were beaten, uh, shot at, imprisoned, et cetera, in the 60s. And, you know, in Russia, you just speak the wrong way and you're risking a 15-year prison sentence. So, uh, you know, I, my hat's off to these brave activists in Russia. Uh, one thing I would speak to about conscientious objection, though, is that COs are not recognized in either Ukraine or in Russia. And, you know, that's a human right. The United Nations is the one who, in 1948, said every citizen in every country of the world should have the right to refuse to kill. Hence the title of my book, I Refuse to Kill. So that's, uh, um, I mean, it's a whole subject altogether. The, the, the nonviolence, the recognition of nonviolence, uh, it's so low and, and, and it's so, uh, people have, have issued to, to perceive it, what, what nonviolence is and how do you go about nonviolence. So can you describe how, what it is and how do you make a decision to become uh, a conscientious objectors? Yes, well, first I'll, I'll mention nonviolence as a philosophy and what it is not. Uh, nonviolence is simply, uh, it's, a lot of people think it's just not being violent uh, or that peace is the absence of war. They're not. You know, peace, uh, nonviolence calls on us to be active. Uh, we see injustice uh, to fight that injustice. And the uh, suffering of one person is the suffering of all of us. So that's what nonviolence is. It's activist oriented, uh, you know, the peace uh, activism starts with ourselves, you know, great moral leaders like Gandhi and the Dalai Lama, etc., all say start with yourself. There's a quote by Gandhi that says, you know, I won't try to convert the whole of society to my point of view. I'll make a beginning with starting with myself. And the Dalai Lama said the same thing. Don't look to the UN or other organizations uh, to make changes. Start with yourself. Look inward. And so that's what it, I started doing myself. And I said, what am I doing? My best buddy was serving in Vietnam. And even though I totally disagreed, I saw that he was following his sense of duty. And then I decided I had to follow my own or else I'm a hypocrite to what I stand for. And so I, in 1968, I declared my uh, CO status. Now, this is something I'd like to make clear, David. Uh, the myth is, the big myth, is that COs are draft dodgers, and they are anything but. They're the opposite, because the COs could have gone to another country and fled. They could have gotten a lawyer to fake their way out of the draft. But instead, if a CO isn't recognized by their local draft board, they willingly go to prison. That's no draft dodging. Yeah, yeah, no, no, and, that, and that's what I'm, I'm, and and you need to to um, dedicate your life in that direction. It's not just a, a five minute protest in onto the corner of the street and then you go back home. It's right. you have the next day you have to 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 cook to keep to keep doing, and uh, and that's what nonviolence is. It's it's way of life. It's, a, it's it's a direction of life. It's a direction of treating oneself, it's a direction of treating the other. And, and so uh, I'm very uh, um, uh, interested by you having done it for so many, so many years and also uh, um, having the life, you, you are not on the street, you are not begging for money, you, 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 you have, uh, uh, I imagine, a decent life. So that's not uh, breaking the future for you. This is true. It's a way of life. And, you know, every day I go out and I say, you know, what can I do uh, to help others? You know, and it makes you feel better about yourself. You know, if you have self-respect, then that's what you give to other people. Oh, if you don't like yourself or you just take a selfish attitude, you're not going to feel good about yourself and you're going to bring that kind of karma out to the, in the world. So uh, you've got, you know, this is a great interview. I got to say you're, you're going not only from the political, but you're making the political personal and the personal political, which I love. 
so so but you know th this is your house this is a presenza and presenza has been built and we develop presenza based on on the launching of uh, uh, in 2009 the march for peace and nonviolence all over the world so this is where we coming from we coming from uh, from that perspective and we really try to uh, to uh, not just seeing the problem in the world today as just political or as just uh, personal or as just social, but but to see them as a more complex, uh, uh, more complex reality of oneself into that social dynamic, and and so uh, there is no there is no one without the other, and the transformation has to be in both sides uh, yeah. as of the personal and the social. So uh, so I was very interesting actually to to talk to you. Can you now can can we go to the uh, art and photography aspect because really I'm, I'm it's such complicated to I have some experience in little bit in photos and it's such complicated work to to be able to transmit what's happening and how can you show like I'm, I'm trying to show poverty in New York and it's quite it's, it's quite a challenge without being on on the on the uh, uh, cliche of, of taking picture of the homeless on the street or on the bench of the subway station. Um, if we can, can you describe it a little bit more? The photography aspect? Yeah, the photographic yes. aspect, yeah. Sure, well, you know, that's a self-expression. And when you feel these moral injustices, you know, nothing like a visual image to bring it home. And that's what I was trying to do. And I had a platform, you know, I, I've been with Getty Images. And so I wanted to use that platform to, you know, uh, showcase these causes. Uh, everything from UNICEF, the suffering of children in the world, uh, to uh, new, the need for nuclear disarmament, uh, et cetera. And so I would use my photography to, you know, supplement my text. And I think it gave it much more power. Uh, so I, I, that's the value of these images. You know, it, it speaks to people. Um, sometimes, you know, we get turned off by the news. You know, if we look at it, it's so negative, you know. Um, so the photography can counter and say, like, this is a cause that should be covered in the news that isn't, just like documentary film. And by the way, I'm trying to develop a documentary film based on my book to strengthen the call for more nonviolent action in the world. Right. If you need, if you need uh, uh, any help, please let us know because we really like to, to be involved. And we have produced a couple of documentary on, uh, on nuclear disarmament, on uh, UBI, uh, Universal Basic Income, on uh, the science people, women uh, leading the, the South American in many, from Mexico to uh, Argentina in Chile. Um, so, but to go back to the photo, like, like, I, like sometimes we, we face the issue of uh, a protest. So you take photo of the protest, but the one really who's going to make the news is going to be the one where the guy beating up somebody or, um, or uh, breaking uh, 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 something on the street, and that's really uh, exactly. So that's really the, so that's really what I wanted to to. If you can cover like in in few minutes, uh, oh yes, that's, well, that's I, really, that I participated in all these peace marches. You know, uh, we would ninety five ninety nine percent of the march was peaceful, orderly. You know, know. <laughs> and taking a moral stand, and then. I, as a photojournalist, I recognized that photographers would flock, excuse me, uh, would flock to the most uh, most um, outrageous scenes. You know, exactly. and people were, uh, and actually, it turned out that a lot of the demonstrators were actually undercover agents who were told to act outlandish and encourage violence. Absolutely. to discredit these marches. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm very aware of that. And this is actually true. But, uh, you know, we need to remember that um, the the sentiment was, you know, because of the press being so negative and everything, uh, that the people got what they deserved, that they were the troublemakers. But really, the vast majority were acting out of the highest ideals of their conscience to stop the killing. 
So yeah, but how do you transmit that? That's my that's that's really the your you challenge. Be positive the within. You got to be positive within. Exactly. And that's where it all starts and that's where it all ends. And then share that positivity with other people. Two big myths I'd like to mention. One is human beings as innately violent. They are not innately violent. Fortunately, you know, the human being has to be trained to kill. You know, it's not something that just comes naturally. Uh, and the other one is that war is inevitable. War is not inevitable. You know, and there have been many examples through history that are unfortunately not in our history books, like uh, nonviolent actions in the face of war that were alternatives. Uh, there are many times these are simply wars by choice. They're invasions and they're glorified and justified. We need to rewrite that history. I'll give you a quick example of World War II. The Danes smuggled out over 7,000 Jews because they let Germany come in and then they secretly smuggled out the Jews and they had the best record for saving the lives of the Jews. So, you know, there are nonviolent alternatives, not to mention what Gandhi did with India. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. And then but the problem is you can you can spend 25 years in university and school. You're never going to learn about them. You can you 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 have no uh, real training on, on that story. We, we're going to spend half of our GDP to uh, on military. Uh, we just spend, uh, uh, I don't know, many billion dollars. Biden just signed in, in, in on the budget, executive budget. One uh, over one trillion dollars for our military budget. One trillion. Exactly. This is a moral statement, David. Yeah, this know. is not just an accounting. This is a moral statement of our priorities that we need to change, move from a war economy to a peace economy. Let's do it. And if I say I want the option in my taxes to be able to not put money going to the military, people are like, oh, da, 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 da. And that, that's, that's really, we should have the option. We should be able to be free to say, okay, on when you pay your taxes, you can have a checkbox. Do you put your money into the military? Because I'm sincerely, I'm very upset with that situation. Because And I'm you should be. This is an international cause, new priorities, you know, there are people that are benefiting from the military industrial complex that perpetuates these wars. And that's at the expense of we, the people. Imagine and that's my that problem with, can... with a little bit with the peace movement. If you look at the map of the United States, it's every state have a check into that military complex. Every state has something to do with that machine. And so uh, every elected official is going to be, oh, we're going to create work, we're going to create job, we're going to create this, we're going to put money there to support that story. So when we go to Washington, I mean, it's already cooked. Yes, every it, has been, it has been, but we cannot give up. Never I give up. I don't and, know. I, I agree with and, you, but the strategy okay. needs to Excellent know. Excellent point you bring up. Absolutely. I agree with you. And the, the legislators stay in power by bringing a piece of that war budget into their state. So yeah. we've got to break that cycle. Exactly. Any things you want to close? Uh, any um, vision of what's going to happen next in, in, in that conflict uh, in well, Europe? One, and well, I'd like to mention that conflict and also leave on a message of hope. Yeah. And uh, I would say as far as the conflict goes, are you talking about Ukraine, Russia, or just the conflict of new priorities? The, the Ukraine. Ukraine. The Ukraine. So yeah. keep in mind that it's not like good guys versus bad guys, okay? War is evil in yeah. itself. We agree. Whoever participates. This yeah. is legal murder. And we've got to stop the slaughter of men, women, and children. So yeah. negotiation and diplomacy are the answer, yeah. not yeah. giving more weapons to one side or the other. And yeah. uh, that's the hope for this conflict in my eyes, okay? That's yeah. one. Uh, and we go to war way too easily, and we've got to realize these are wars of choice, not necessity. So uh, number two is I'm very positive about today's generation, not just in America, but around the world, because they're questioning everything. 
and that's healthy. And that's the spirit that came out of the 60s. Uh, my generation, I'm very proud. It was the first time a young generation actually stopped a war with persistence. It took 10 years, but they did it. And I encourage today's generation, stay with the activism, not only for war, but for diversity, you know, and uh, social change. We, we've got to have that hand in hand with the peace. And the last thing I would like to say is the only way, real way to peace is through nonviolent action. And we all have a responsibility to contribute. And then we have a ripple effect. And who knows what positive outcomes will come from that. Francisco, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I'm going to have you again. We, we need to talk more about the photo. But for today, that was your show. You're a great guy. I'd love it. Thank you so much. Uh, please keep watching your news on Presenza.com and uh, we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you.